So I was last year's Herberman uh, lecturer, and uh, it was wonderful to not only speak with the audience, but also to interact with a, with a lot of the folks in the room. And, and I have one little story that I want to share with you, and it's, it's a tribute to Bill. Uh, uh, as shouldn't be a surprise to, to most of you, uh, Bill followed up on, on, uh, on the talk that I gave, and he, and he came up to Baltimore, and, and we sat in my office, and we were, we were kicking around ideas, and for some strange reason, I, I had this idea. Gee, I wonder how long it takes somebody driving up their car to a drive through at McDonald's or Burger King, how long do they spend in the, in the line before they get their meal? And somehow or another, I, I, I think I said, it's probably nine minutes. Right. And, uh, and from that little interaction, uh, we said, gee, I wonder whether we could come up with a nine-minute meal now, something that you could make in nine minutes rather than staying in a drive-through uh, uh, for nine minutes. So as an academic, uh, you have an idea. You promptly remember it for about 40 seconds. And, uh, but it was Bill who took it and ran with it, and it's now part of the Less Cancer. Yeah, and it's up and running, and people are, people are retweeting, Instagramming their nine-minute meals all over the globe because so, of that conversation. So, so for many of you, many of, uh, of, of the younger generation here, uh, you're going to have great ideas in your life, but you need to have people who can actually implement those ideas. And so they're a rarer breed, and, and Bill is really a mentor for that. So I think that deserves a round of applause for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Bill asked me to make just a couple of, of comments uh, without PowerPoint, without any of the, the normal accoutrements of, of academia. And, and I just want to make a couple of, of quick comments with respect to the cancer world. Uh, one is, when I was growing up, uh, cancer was truly silent. People didn't talk about it. Uh, if you saw an obituary in the newspaper, it was somebody had a long illness. Uh, Cancer hospitals were not called cancer hospitals. They were called memorial hospitals, like Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, in New York. And so cancer was, was viewed uh, societally as, a, um, as an infectious disease, as something that, that would go from one generation to another. And we didn't talk about it as a society. And as a consequence, patients and their families felt you know, you know, really under attack. By, by society because we didn't talk about it. This is an enormous change in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, we talk about disease, and that in turn is what leads to the ability to talk about prevention. So last year I mentioned uh, in the lecture that we have had phenomenal success in heart disease in the United States. In the last uh, almost 40 years, we have reduced cardiovascular death by 75%, 75%. That's a phenomenal success. We have reduced cancer deaths by 17%. The challenges uh, in understanding the mechanisms uh, of these diseases are, are, are giving us insights forward, but keep in mind that the public is really demanding if we have such success in cardiovascular disease, why aren't we seeing that in cancer, which touches every single family in this country? And so let me leave uh, with, with three quick little remarks with respect to prevention. One is that cervical cancer and a number of head and neck cancers could be eliminated in our lifetime. Cervical cancer deaths could be eliminated in our lifetimes with the implementation of and distribution of the human papillomavirus vaccines. I personally, as a public health person, am appalled at the attack on vaccination that not only saves lives in the United States, but cervical cancer causes 350,000 deaths of women around the world, mostly in South Asia and Africa. This is a moral imperative that we must fight back on. We have eradicated many acute diseases in the last century, here's a cancer that can be eliminated in your lifetime. So that's point one. The second point is dealing with tobacco. Patients who smoke 
do worse on their cancer treatments. People who smoke are much more susceptible to developing cancers that fundamentally are not curable. And for many of the young people here, you may enter into that area where you will not be a smoker by age 19, but as soon as you start entering into the workforce, the stresses of the workforce, the, the challenges that you face is now leading to an epidemic increase in smoking in people in their early 20s. And, and this is something that also needs to be fought back on and is preventable. The next challenge is if you have a parent or a relative who smokes, you are really their coach in trying to develop prevention strategies. And that's also something for which there are a lot of tools available to you. My final comment is, is that many of you heard a, a lot about the former vice president's uh, moonshot initiative on, on, on cancer. And I encourage everyone here to, to at least read the executive summary of the moonshot blue ribbon panel and ask yourself the following question. Where's the prevention? Where is it in, in the 10 uh, points that came out for, for research and, and carrying out our, our cancer mandate, where is prevention in that document? And keep in mind that for all of us who are involved in the prevention world, people ask, does prevention make a difference? Well, the answer is absolutely positively yes. You stop smoking, your risk of lung cancer goes down. You get vaccinated against the human papillomavirus and your, your risk of a number of cancers is eliminated. And so in this century, we have the opportunity of converting that 17% reduction to the 75% achievement that we had in heart disease. And this is what keeps us in public health going. And so for all of you uh, here, you know, this is this is an important lifetime thing that we're involved in, in terms of assuring that far fewer people go through cancer therapy and are able to look back on a healthy and productive life. Thanks.